Good morning, Buzzfeeders. Welcome to Breakfast with Buzzfeed. Thanks for the enthusiasm, Tommy. And this is our first edition of Breakfast with Buzzfeed. And Ryan Cordell is here. I'm going to give an intro in just a minute. But if you have any other suggestions for external folks to come in and speak and share insights and things that you're curious about, please let me, Tommy, or Jamie know. And we'll work on getting them to come in. Um, and I appreciate everybody being on time. It's amazing. Um, so I'm going to introduce Tommy. I mean, Tommy, hi. I'm going to introduce Ryan. Um, and I'm going to read some notes. So I apologize, but this is above my academic level. So Ryan is an assistant professor of English at Northeastern University in Boston. His background focuses on intersections between literary, periodical, and religious culture. And he is also a core member of the New Lab for Texts, Maps, and Networks, which maybe you can describe. Um, he will discuss Northeastern's viral text projects, which you can check out at viraltext.org, and which is tracing the prehistory of virality in 19th century newspapers and magazines. The antebellum period was a time much like ours, apparently, uh, when rapid advancements in communications technology were continually changing the way people wrote, published, and distributed media. What kinds of content went viral 150 years before BuzzFeed, and what might historical viral text teach us about what goes viral online today? So with that, Ryan, thanks for coming. So uh, let, let me know, well, go ahead. Uh, let, let me know if I'm not uh, loud enough. Sometimes uh, my students say I don't project, so just wave at me if I stop. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to be talking to you all. I, I was telling Regis earlier that when I told my students that I couldn't be in class today because I was talking at BuzzFeed, it was as if I had said I had been invited by the president to come to the White House. Um, there was just like awe that rolled over them. So uh, that's great. I've got total cred for the rest of the semester. Um, so, so yeah, seven reasons why 19th century newspapers were the original BuzzFeed. I, I decided to try and borrow your form uh, for this talk. And well, let's just get, get right into it. Like, uh, how many of you have ever looked at a 19th century newspaper before? OK, they don't have a lot of hands. Uh, you don't have to have my weird interest here. But um, as, as a, my introduction uh, said, it, the 19th century, particularly the early 19th century, is this time of really rapid change in the way that people communicate with one another. We don't tend to think about that, but printing was getting really fast really quickly. The steam press changed. You guys have all seen like an old-fashioned pull press, right, where every single impression on the page, someone had to pull it to make it. Well, that goes away because all of a sudden you have these steam-driven machines that can print thousands of pages a minute, right? And print gets really cheap, and newspapers begin to spring up all over the country as a result. People can also get around a lot more quickly. All of a sudden, there's this new railroad, right? There are these new steam boats. And there's a lot of writing in the 19th century where people are just trying to grapple with this change of speed. Like, all of a sudden, you don't have to spend days getting from one side of the country to the other. All of a sudden, the whole idea that seems so common to us of commuting becomes possible because you can live outside of a city and you can commute into work, which you couldn't do before. It would take you half the day just to get into the city if you tried to do that, right? And then, of course, you see the telegraph wires. There's also the in, in, invention of the telegraph, right? And some scholars have said that the telegraph actually even gives us our modern idea of weather. Because before the telegraph, you couldn't actually trace a weather system moving across the country. It was impossible to know if you were in Boston that it was raining in New York. Right? And all of a sudden, you can communicate these ideas almost instantly. And this changes everything for people during the period. So this is a map. This is one of the first maps I ever made when I was experimenting with this stuff, uh, trying to look at the growth of newspapers in the United States to get a sense of like, how quickly newspapers change. You can see in the 18th century, right? you see just a few dots like in the major cities of the East Coast. But watch what happens in the first decades of the 19th century. It starts to kind of look like a, an AT&T coverage <laughs> map, which I, I need to change the color scheme, actually, for that very reason. But you can see right, how uh, newspapers begin to spring up. And all of a sudden, every town and city in the United States has not one, but usually two or three newspapers. Because newspapers at the time, uh, there's no uh, sense of what we think of sort of modern journalistic impartiality. Newspapers either were owned by a political party or a religious denomination 
or a social cause. So you were either a democratic newspaper, or you were a Republican newspaper, or you were an abolitionist newspaper. Uh, and in some ways, like when people talk about like MSNBC and Fox News, it's like a return to form <laughs> in some ways from an older uh, idea of journalism. All right. The other interesting thing about newspapers is that they don't actually look a lot like uh, a modern newspaper. They don't look like the New York Times, for instance. Uh, for a lot of people, the newspaper was their primary mode of any kind of reading. Right? Uh, and, and entertainment, really, because if you think about it, right, there's, there's certainly no internet, there's no television, there's no radio, uh, and books are still pretty expensive. And so for a lot of people, the newspaper was the main thing that sort of kept them entertained during the day. And so if you look at a 19th century newspaper, and actually we have the benefit of being able to zoom in, if you actually look at one of these things, it's a page about like this with these incredibly <coughs> tight columns and really small text, so you had to like spend uh, time reading it. But you've got things on here that look like news. This is a report of a bill that's uh, sort of working its way through Congress. Kind of working. All right. You've also got uh, op-eds right here. There are those who would sell the birthright of our nation's glory for a mess of official pottage. And this guy's pissed off about what's going on, right? You've got advertisements and other kinds of short little notices of things that are going on. These are not even like news stories. They're, they're like tweets in a way. <laughs> this is really a tweet about what's going on uh, by the ex-governor of the state. You've got anecdotes. And anecdotes are these things that sort of tread the line between fact and fiction. Uh, they, they purport to be true, but they're also not really sourced, and there's no way to verify that they're true. They're like little stories of the world. Is that a common term? Like, back, like a lot of newspapers said anecdote of. A anecdote is, yeah, it's a very common term in these. And, and it kind of signals that this is not, not quite uh, news. It, it's, a, it's a little story. It's a narration. But it's, it's not explicitly fiction as this is, because newspapers also printed fiction. They printed short stories. They printed uh, entertainment, content that was entertaining. And they also printed, sorry, this is being very slow. I might have to click here. They also clicked, uh, printed poetry. And when I talk about 19th century newspapers uh, to audiences, I tend to say, actually, they were kind of like BuzzFeed, uh, because they aggregated all kinds of content onto one page, from really serious news right, to entertainment. And actually, if you look at something like poetry, I want you to imagine on the modern website the music video, right? There aren't music videos. There's not even recorded music yet. And, and poetry in the sort of popular culture filled a very similar spot to uh, where music that we share and exchange does today. And most 19th century newspapers printed poetry. There was at least one poem, maybe two, in every issue. So the other thing, the other similarity that I want to point out, is that newspapers fostered a kind of virality for popular content. So in the early decades of the 19th century, there are no, no laws that protect any of the text that's printed in newspapers and magazines as intellectual property. Right? It's not even recognized that one would imagine it to be intellectual property. And the way that newspapers worked was on a system of exchange. So if I was an editor in St. Louis, I would subscribe to newspapers in New York and Boston and Cincinnati, and when they came in, I would look through them, and I would find anything that I thought my readers would be interested in, and then I would reprint it. I would, I would uh, just cut it out, and then I would have my people reset it. And sometimes when I reprinted it, I would change it. I would take off the author's name. I would change the title. I would put one of my writers in as the author. Uh, there were, all kinds of things could happen. And so content just propagated through the newspaper system in a really similar way, I think, to the way we share content with each other today. So here we have this one poem. Uh, it's called here, The Song of Labor. It's by John Greenleaf Whittier, who's a very popular poet at the time. And it gets reprinted. Actually, it gets reprinted at least uh, in, in about 50 different newspapers. But here's a few other examples. And as it gets reprinted, the title changes a little bit. It goes from being The Song of Labor to The Corn Song to the Huskers, to the Songs of Labor, the Huskers, to the Farmer's Corn Song. Like the name changes as it moves. And sometimes the, the content itself would change a little bit. Uh, words would get 
taken out, added. Uh, it was very uh, fungible, the way that content moved around. So here we can see that one poem, and we can see it's, it's spread around the country. This works. There we go. It's trying. And here I'm trying to signal, too, that there's a really close connection to the way that things spread around the country and some of the communications infrastructure at the time. In this case, the railroads, which is one of the ways that newspapers moved from one end of the country to the other so that pieces could get reprinted uh, down the line. And so there's a really close connection between the spread of media during the 19th century and the growth of infrastructure like railroads and then eventually the telegraph network. I'm going to take a really slight detour to talk about how we're trying to study this. Uh, there were millions and millions of pages of newspapers produced during the 19th century. Remember that explosion of all these different papers, right? And for a really long time, if you wanted to study this, the way that you would study it is that you would uh, open the newspapers and start reading. <laughs> and noting every little text that came along, which basically means that no one studied this, because it was just impossible. You could read newspapers for your entire career and never find multiple reprints of the same story. It's just too much, just too much data, really. So lately, uh, the, the Library of Congress and other organizations have started digitizing these newspapers and creating uh, text, like raw text, that we can process with, uh, with computational methods. Now, even these archives, you can't get at it really well because you don't know what to search for, right? Searching is only as good as what you know to search for. And a lot of these texts were popular during their day. They were widely reprinted, but we've forgotten about them since. And so I've been working with a computer scientist at Northeastern to try and figure out a way to find the stuff that was really popular in the 19th century, but that we've since forgotten about. And so we're basically taking all of the text data in these online archives and using, I, I won't get into it all, but using n-grams. You guys have heard about n-grams from some of the Google projects to cut these uh, giant archives up into little segments and to look for matching segments across millions of pages. And so far, we found about 40,000 texts that were reprinted during the 19th century, many thousands of which were printed lots and lots of times, enough that we would say they sort of went viral in 19th century newspapers. All right, so back to the list. So the other thing, the other similarity that I like to point out is that antebellum readers liked and shared texts in, in ways that are not that dissimilar from the way that we do. This is a, a 19th century scrapbook. And scrapbooks were incredibly popular during the 19th century. And what they were for a lot of people was a way to save these little pieces from the newspaper that you thought were interesting. So you would have your newspaper, you would cut out what you liked, and then you would paste it into a scrapbook. And I want you, as you look at this, to think of your Facebook wall, to think of your Pinterest account, Right, where you're saving all this stuff online that you find interesting, 19th century readers did the same thing. They cut it out, they saved it, they went back to it later to, and shared it with friends, too. They would share scrapbooks. Uh, here's all the stuff that I've been cutting out over the past year, so you can look through it. So what kinds of stuff went viral in antebellum newspapers? Um, as I'm working through these, I, I just sort of think about the kinds of things that, that you share that people you know share today, because I actually think there's some interesting similarities. So, of course, news. In this case, this is the report. This is the message that Queen Victoria sent to President James Buchanan upon the completion of the transatlantic cable. So as soon as the cable was completed, the Queen sends a message of congratulations to the President, and this gets widely reprinted in newspapers. What I find interesting about this is that this actually goes viral twice. It goes viral once, with a lot of commentary about how rude the queen was. That her message was really abrupt and just horrible. And then they realized that it was operator error and that the telegraph operator had not copied the entire message that had been sent. And so then it goes viral again with the whole message and a lot of apologies about how the queen really wasn't rude. It was our fault. We're really sorry. Uh, the queen was very, was very uh, gracious in her letter. Plenty of political news, right? Again, not a surprise, right? But again, I'm picturing the BuzzFeed homepage, right? Where you've got your news, you've got your opinion, and then other kinds of content as well. Talked about poetry. Parodies, right? So this is, uh, I should go back. 
This is a, a poem by a Scottish poet called Charles McKay. It's a very sort of sappy, uh, sentimental poem about how our souls are eternal, and when we die, we don't really die. And so, of course, a lot of people shared this because they liked that sentiment. They thought it was lovely, and so it gets widely shared. But then it starts getting parodied. And so this is a parody that's talking basically about how capricious uh, women are. It's written by a bachelor who's talking about how, how uh, flighty all the women that he tries to interact with are. And then there's another parody written by a woman that's a parody of this parody, right? So um, imagine, right, the video on YouTube then gets the parody video and the response to that, yeah. Hey, things are going viral. Are you talking about being printed in number, number of newspapers or I being scrapbook? Okay. Well, printed in newspapers and also scrapbook. The scrapbooks are harder to get at. That's like we theory, have a yeah. few examples that we can okay. sort of look through. We know the kinds of things that got scrapbooked, and these kinds of things did get scrapbooked. But and, and we're talking about like usually days, weeks, months, like what types like how like what's like you know is it, you said it's telegraph usually here or trains that are basically. So the period that we've looked at so far is largely before telegraphs. Okay. And so actually I'll get to that. I'm going to talk okay. specifically about the, the rate of spread. Yeah. Recipes and household tips. Right? This is uh, if, if you want to know how to create a gum Arabic starch so that you can starch your shirts. Here you go. There's a, a nice tip for you. But these kinds of like household tips are really common in the widely reprinted newspaper text. And also recipes. Reviews. This is a, a really popular article basically telling Americans that actually tomatoes are really good to eat. Um, we tend to think of tomatoes as something that everyone eats, but actually in the 19th century, it was not really a part of American cuisine. Like Tomatoes really hadn't been introduced to America yet. And so this is this long. It's really a list in many ways. It's first, second, third, all the reasons why you should be eating tomatoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, lots of travel narratives. I think part of this is, is, is historically specific, right? Travel was really difficult in the 19th century. Very few people actually got, in fact, a vast majority of people never left about a 30-mile radius uh, of where they were born. Um, because travel, even with the, the trains, which begin to expand things, for a lot of people it was too expensive, which is out of reach. Uh, and travel narratives are really popular. Accounts of places in Europe, accounts of places uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, a lot of these go viral. And in some ways, I, I when I read these, I think of the sort of pictures of your friends traveling on your Facebook feed, right, where you're sort of traveling vicariously through them. There's, there's a lot of that going on here. And then an awful lot of advice. Advice to parents, advice to young people about sort of how to live well, how to raise your children right. And, and again, uh, imagining the articles that people tend to share online, right? If you're a parent, a lot of them have to do with parenting, right? A lot of sentiment. Uh, I, I have a friend who uh, every day on Facebook posts what she calls the weepy of the day, which is the video that's supposed to make you cry. It's the soldier coming home and his children running to him or you know something. It's the child battling bravely against whatever they're battling against, right? Um, there's an awful lot of these sort of sentimental stories also in, that get widely shared in 19th century newspapers. A lot of domestic pieces. And a lot of trivia. Uh, there are these columns that are really almost nothing more than lists of interesting facts about the world. Um, in this case, like how many languages are spoken in the world, how many different religions are there in the world. Uh, this kind of trivia actually gets really widely circulated in the newspaper during the 19th century. And there are an awful lot of jokes. Uh, I have given up trying to explain this joke to people. Uh, it, it's about churning butter. It does not translate well to the 21st century, but I promise you it was really funny in the 19th century, and I won't try to explain it. Um, <laughs> and then there are a lot of these kind of anecdotes or vignettes uh, that are, again, that tread this line between fact and fiction. This one claims to be a fragment of a, of a letter that a dying wife wrote to her husband. And in the letter, she sort of tells him you know, that she loves him and that he should always think of her, but that he should go on and live his life. Uh, and what I find interesting about these is they're so patently fictional, right? They're too perfect to be true, but they, they participate in some of the conventions of journalism, right? They say, like, this is a letter that we're transcribing for you, as if it was, like, a real thing in the world, right? Ryan, how easily were hoaxes spread? Hoaxes? <laughs> oh. I didn't even see that. <laughs> That's my next slide. Yeah, hoaxes. A lot of hoaxes get perpetuated in the 19th century newspaper. Um, 
one of the most, this is one of the most famous hoaxes. Has anyone heard of the, the Great Moon Hoax of 1835? <laughs> there was a recent fairly popular book written about it. So when I say that, people do sometimes know. So in 1835, the New York Sun, which was a penny paper, it was one of, the penny paper was this new genre of papers that cost a penny. Um, that, that made newspapers available to people who had not been able to afford them before. Um, and they were largely seen as sort of disreputable, and, and uh, we use the term maybe muckraking now, right? But um, in 1835, the New York Sun began printing this series in which they claimed that this astronomer, Sir John Herschel, had built a, a bigger telescope than anyone had ever built before. Uh, he worked in South Africa, and he had pointed it at the moon. And he had seen a civilization on the moon. And that civilization looked something like this. There were these bat men, these men with bat wings that sort of flew around. And they, they printed a whole series of these uh, pieces in which he describes in incredible detail this civilization that he was seeing on the moon. Um, what I find interesting about this is uh, they, they put, this is a real guy, this astronomer. He was not a made up person. But he really worked in South Africa, which meant that it was impossible to very quickly talk to him and see if he had really made these discoveries, which he had not. He was completely unaware that this was, that this was being reported about his research. Um, and what I find really interesting is the kind of stuff that, that they begin to print about this man-bat civilization. If you really think about it, it's, it's such detail that no telescope ever could have sussed this out. I mean, he talks about like their religious customs and things like that, which if you're imagining looking through a telescope, how would you know about their religious customs, right? Um, but people ate this up, and the sun's circulation exploded. It went from being a tiny little newspaper to being pretty much the biggest newspaper in New York City because of this story and because of the way that people were getting really excited about this story. What I find most interesting, though, is that eventually the hoax is exposed. Right? Eventually, some people do actually send a boat to South Africa to say, Sir John Herschel, did you really do this? And he says, no, I did not. And this gets back to New York, and all of the New York Sun's competitors print the denunciations of this story. It's a hoax. It's, it's not true. The Sun's circulation uh, does not decrease at all. <laughs> it seems like ultimately no one cared that it wasn't true. Um, and in fact, the, the whole moon hoax then gets packaged as fiction, and it gets sold as a book. And the book itself is really popular, as like a work of science fiction or something like that. So there's this really interesting line between fact and fiction in these 19th century papers that I don't know that readers actually care all that much. Because again, this was mostly about entertainment in a way. I don't know why that's blank. So we've done some work. Uh, like st uh, statistical analyses of the kinds of things that moved really quickly around the country versus the kinds of things that moved really slowly. And what we found is that things that we would call sort of newsy, right? Stories, that, and here, if you look at Mexico, this is like the United States is uh, thinking about and then going to war with Mexico during this time, right? The Mexican-American War. Uh, Taylor here is the president, President Taylor. Basically, these sort of newsy pieces moved really quickly, and they had an average lag time, actually, of about two weeks. And when I say two weeks, they made it all the way from uh, New England to an, a newspaper in Hawaii, an outpost in Hawaii, in about two weeks, which was much quicker than we expected. We actually didn't expect that news could have moved that quickly in the 19th century when we started this. And these terms that we might associate with the more like entertainment pieces or the more literary pieces, they moved more slowly, and they had an average time of about six months. They took about six months to move around the country. And actually, some of them took years. Uh, they, they would, when I said that uh, an editor would, when an editor would get a newspaper, he would sort through it. And I said he would cut out the stuff that he thought his readers were interested in. He would cut all these pieces out, and then he would literally sort them into drawers based on their length. Because the job of a newspaper editor is, right, I've got a page of news that I have to fill every day. And then he would literally say, ah, I've got a four, I've got a four inch gap in the newspaper. And then he would open the four inch drawer, right? And he would find something that was four inches long that he could then put into the newspaper so that he could publish the issue. And so some of these pieces would get reprinted even years later because they were sitting in some drawer and then found. So it's a different idea of virality. Why did they use to print the little pieces of it? Because that, that wasn't a regular print back then, right? They're using a steam press, but you still have to set the type. I'm saying, but like for the individual pieces. 
well, so he's got he gets it from another newspaper. It's printed in another oh, newspaper, oh, and then he's literally cutting it out with scissors okay. and putting yeah, it in the drawer. Font across all these papers right now. And then if he wanted to reprint it, he would give it to his compositors, who are the people who actually set the type, right? And so they would actually have to reset the type, which is where you get a lot of errors too, because as they reset it, I mean, think of a game of telephone, right, where it moves from person to person as it gets reset over and over again. You get even errors just introduced. All right, what we don't have when we look at these 19th century newspapers is a lot of fine-grained data about how people read these things. We have to make a lot of inferences based on pretty limited evidence because we don't have a like button on all of these pieces. <laughs> so we can't say, like, we know for a fact that three million people liked this particular article. Uh, we have to make inferences based on how often it was republished, uh, sometimes when editors would republish something, they would say why they were republishing it. They would have a few sentences saying, uh, we thought our readers would be very interested in this piece because, you know, and those are like a gold mine for me because they give me some insight into why something was getting reprinted. Re but we don't have this, um, which does make this difficult. So I've been thinking a lot about sort of why certain pieces go, go viral in the 19th century. And, and some of the conclusions that I'm coming to have to do with something that you guys probably know more about than I do, to be quite honest, which is shareability, right? Um, the pieces that get reprinted are the ones that can be put into lots of different contexts, right? The thing that I can print because I think it's really exciting, and you can print to say how stupid it is, right? You, you get these like political pieces that the Democratic newspaper will print and say, this is evidence of how wonderful our president is. He's the greatest president who has ever walked the face of the planet. And then the Republican newspaper will say, we're reprinting this to show you what a complete moron the president is because he said all of these things. Um, and you get other pieces like Washington's Farewell Address that gets reprinted over and over and over again. And it gets reprinted before the Civil War as an example of why the country should be unified and why we should not uh, go to war with each other. But it also gets reprinted by Southerners who talk about our, the sort of... Um, spirit of the United States as being independent, et cetera, et cetera. So there are these pieces that can get used in really different ways by different groups of people that tend to be the most widely reprinted. And I was thinking about my own uh, BuzzFeed use, right? What are the things that I like and share? I don't share everything on BuzzFeed. A lot of you, as I look around, you're much younger and cooler than me. And a lot of this stuff is way over my head, to be quite honest, although my students probably love it. But I was an army brat, and I remember thinking, looking through this piece and saying, oh yeah, it's totally my experience, and sharing it, and all the uh, other army brats on my Facebook wall, you know, commenting about how, how true all of this was. Uh, I'm, I love giving public talks like this, but if you put me in a cocktail party, I'm completely worthless. Um, I'm, I'm totally an introvert. You guys post a lot about being an introvert, which has been awesome lately. Um, so these really resonate with me, right? Obviously, I'm an English teacher. I love all the posts about English majors, even when you guys are a bit unfair and poking fun at English majors. But... <laughs> ah, yeah, so any Vellum newspapers also loved lists. You guys print lists, right? Lists were really popular in the 19th century newspaper. And for me, this was a complete revelation. I did not know this going into this study. But an awful lot of the most widely reprinted pieces are in list form. So this is a piece called Maxims to Guide a Young Man. And this is a list of basically the moral, ethical, social uh, maxims that would help a young man be a good, upstanding citizen. And I've, I've, when I've talked about this, I actually thought, like, if I knew someone really skilled with animated GIFs, I think we could turn this into a BuzzFeed post. <laughs> but we've got, like, good, we keep good company or none, always speak the truth, make few promises, and there are some that seem historically very weird, uh, like, uh, where is it? Have no very intimate friends. <laughs> I don't know why. This one, this one I'm particularly interested in because we've done some like wider uh, searches for this. And we find this particular piece uh, reprinted all the way into the 21st century. There, there is a version of this exact piece that gets reprinted in a driver's ed manual, just like four years ago. And in the driver's, this, because it's a list, it's easily adaptable. Again, remember, it can get changed, it can get modified for different contexts. So like when this gets reprinted in magazines for, there's a, a young merchant's magazine, it becomes maxims to guide a young merchant. 
and the maxims change too. They become more about business and less about kind of moral virtue. Um, in the driver's ed manual, these get changed all to like driving related maxims, mostly. So there's a, let's see, it might be down here. There's one of the maxims, which is uh, drink no very intoxicating drinks. And in the driver's ed manual, it is drink no very intoxicating drinks and then drive. Right? So they just extend it a little bit. Um, this is a, a this is also a list, although it's not quite in list form. Uh, this is a list that is all about 19th century uh, sexism and misogyny, to be quite <laughs> honest. Uh, this is supposed to be a list of all the advantages that women have over men in society, and, and you'll be happy to know uh, that a woman a woman may say what she pleases to you without being knocked down for it. <laughs> Uh, she can take a snooze after dinner while her husband has to go to work. So that's a real advantage. Um, anyway, uh, it's a list, though, um, historically specific list. And then even this one, uh, which reminds me of some kind of uh, interesting fact post that I see on websites. This is just a list of basically how all the apostles died, um, in case you wanted to know. <laughs> so uh, in a broader sense, I think newspapers allowed all of these readers who were spread across the country, and again, where communication and travel is pretty difficult, have this sense of commonality. There are all these shared texts between all these newspapers. And sometimes when I look at these newspapers, I think the reprinting they're doing is about performing their connections, right? So if you're in St. Louis, you're saying, look, I'm connected to people in New York and Boston and, and Cincinnati. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville, who a lot of people quote, he says that nothing but a newspaper can drop the same mind into a thousand the same thought into a thousand minds at the same moment. Now, when he talks about the same moment, obviously his idea of that is a little different than ours. It's not the instantaneous uh, connection that you would get when something gets posted on a website. But their sense of simultaneity was a little bit broader than ours, right? But the idea that one thought could be distributed across the whole country in just a couple of weeks, this was really new and revolutionary at the time. One of the ways this happened was with the post office. And we tend to think about the post office as um, a way to share like personal correspondence. But actually, the post office was originally established to spread information. And uh, letters, like personal letters and packages, were really expensive to mail. They were purposely really expensive to mail. And newspapers and magazines were really cheap to mail. And in fact, a newspaper editor paid no postage at all for any of the newspapers that he subscribed to. And the reason for that was that the post office was supposed to help spread information. It was supposed to help create an educated citizenry, right? And so if you look at this picture of a 19th century post office, you see all these big things sticking out of the carols? These are all newspapers. And in fact, some people tried to exploit this by mailing a newspaper and in the margins of the newspaper writing a letter. <laughs> because it was cheaper to send the newspaper than it was to send the letter. When and why did that vision of the post office change? I think a lot of it had to do with the telegraph, actually. So after the telegraph is established and it's uh, you can send news that way, um, the postal laws begin to change and letters start to get cheaper and newspapers so that they get a little bit of postage and then a little more. And by the end of the 19th century, it looks more like our modern postal system. But yeah, I think it's all about the telegraph and that's, that's how it changes. And then we talked a little bit about this already, but there's this relationship also with the railroads. So sharing these viral texts creates these kind of social networks of information exchange. So one of the things I've been using, is, I've been uh, doing, is using all of this data about reprints between newspapers to try and figure out who the most influential uh, publications of the 19th century were. So I've been doing network modeling on the newspapers to try and see who was sharing with whom. And, and actually, in this case, if you've never seen one of these uh, graphs, although you probably all have at some point, the nodes, the circles here, are individual newspapers, and the edges, the lines between them, are shared texts. And the more text any newspaper shared, the thicker that line becomes, right? And so actually, these really thick lines mean that the Nashville Union and the Daily Dispatch, that they were reprinting thousands and thousands of the same text during the 19th century. And this is a way of trying to see, like, who is talking to who. Again, like, we don't have a lot of direct evidence for this. So we have to do this kind of modeling to get this indirect evidence. Who's sharing with who? What kinds of connections were shaping how information circulated during the 19th century? And we're, we're finding some surprises. We're finding actually 
that like Nashville, Tennessee was this real central hub of information exchange during the period, which frankly, I didn't know going into this. I wouldn't have thought of that. I tend to think of New York, Boston, and Philadelphia as the major print centers during the period. So reflections, like where is this going? I'm, I'm out of the list now, the list is done. <laughs> First thing we need is more data. Um, we've been working with the Library of Congress's newspaper data because it's open. It's uh, millions of newspaper pages that we can just grab the data and work with it. There are an awful lot of commercial providers of data, um, of historical data, um, but their data basically costs more than humanities professors can afford. Uh, English professors, you'll be shocked to learn, don't have giant research budgets. They just don't. Uh, not like the sciences. And so we're right now we're negotiating with several commercial database providers to try and get more newspapers so that we can expand this study and, and learn even more about this this time. So just as one example, this is one of the widely reprinted pieces from our study in the Chronicling America data set. That's the Library of Congress's data set. We found about 50 newspapers that reprinted that. And that's about half of the newspapers we're studying because we've got about 120 newspapers that we're looking at right now. But if we expand and we actually look for this thing in all of the commercial databases, we find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies of this. And so we're trying to get that data. Uh, here, this is my shaming map. Um, all of the states that are very dark, they don't make uh, their historical newspapers available in open databases, right? including, including Massachusetts. So whenever I talk about this around Boston, I say, by the way, none of our newspapers are in open databases. Uh, and just to try and like shame them into doing it, but I, I don't know if it's gonna work. So I've also been trying to think about like, what does this mean? There's this article that I really like by Robert Payne called Virality 2.0, and he talks about the Facebook like button as a, as a flat signifier, because he says like, just that some, because someone likes something doesn't tell you much. There are all kinds of reasons why someone likes something, right? They like it because they like it, they like it because they hated it, they like it because their buddy printed, posted it, and they know that if they don't like it, their buddy will think they don't like them, right? <laughs> there are all these reasons. And in some ways, this reprinting that I'm studying is, is also a flat signifier. Like it's hard to know why something got reprinted. You have to get at it from all these other places. All right. I also have some personal experience, tiny little personal experience with modern virality that I've been reflecting on. Uh, did any of you happen to like this photo about a year ago? Hi world, we want a puppy. Our dad said we can get one if we get a million likes. Yeah, so those are my kids. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. This is this is my tiny fleeting moment of internet uh, virality. Uh, one, one of the first to ask for a million likes. Drop them over. So you got two dogs? A lot of people ask that. So being on this side of it has given me a chance to reflect in some interesting ways. Um, a lot of people have asked me if I sort of uh, uh, masterminded this. Uh, I wish I could say that. I'm not, I'm not that, that clever, to be quite honest. Because I spent a lot of time thinking about virality, I actually genuinely thought that a million likes might be hard to come by. Because um, a lot of people try and get a lot of traction and don't. Um, but what's interesting is beyond the likes, we got thousands and thousands and thousands of messages and comments. And because of the internet, we had to employ an army of family and friends to delete all of the horrific comments uh, because my children were actually looking at this page. <laughs> um, but I should say that was a tiny sliver, right? The vast majority of comments were, were lovely and supportive. And um, we also got tons and tons of private messages, thousands of private messages on this page. And what I found really interesting in looking at it is thinking about why people like this photo. So a lot of people said, whoa, a girl who likes Star Wars. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> like. <laughs> hey, I'm a twin. That's yeah. really amazing. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Small fry is totally cool. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad's an idiot. We're gonna prove him wrong because he's a jerk. Like, and actually, even beyond this, you know, that picture is like a static picture, and people drew all kinds of conclusions that are not embedded in that picture. So we got messages. It's so great to see a strong Mormon family 
said like we were horrible Massachusetts liberals who were teaching our kids they don't have to work for anything in this world. Uh, that's one example of that. Uh, there were folks who took it in a really different direction. And then there were, of course, the sort of pop culture remixes that happened. So back to the project. We're going to be making all of our data openly available. Um, and we're going to have an API so that people who are interested in doing cool like maps and network graphs with their data can, can play around with this historical stuff. Uh, that's it's ready to go, but I'm not quite ready to release it yet. It'll be released pretty soon. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me. I, I'm open. Thank you. That was awesome. Thanks, Ryan. I have a few questions, but I want to open it up to all of you first. What questions do you have? Laura? Did you ever come across an example of a quiz that was researched? That is a good question. Um, I have not seen quizzes yet. What I have seen are um, puzzles, like codes. And there would be things like, um, there would be a, a, an encoded message, and then the editor would say, like, write into the editor with your solution. And then a few weeks later, the editor would print it if anyone had solved the, the puzzle. And actually, like, as a kind of popular example of this, Edgar Allan Poe was a newspaper editor. That was actually his primary job uh, when he wasn't writing. And he loved doing that. He, he printed a lot of like puzzles. And then he would, uh, it's very interesting because what he would publish is like a, a follow-up where he mocked all his readers for being unable to solve his puzzle. <laughs> uh, and I'm always wondering like if anyone actually did solve the puzzle and he just refused to acknowledge it in print because he didn't want to prove it. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I have not seen a lot of the, I haven't seen any quizzes yet. And maybe it's because, I mean, the newspapers do that kind of interactivity. It's definitely more difficult. Online. My mind is still blown about the puppies thing. But, um, <laughs> questions? Um, I'm just wondering, when you went back and, and found the like, Cambridge Analytica data, was that because you were trying to find the I mean, I mean, in in I'm some ways. The question a little bit for the reporter. Oh yeah, so Sorry. so so she's asking about how how basically how I decide to use this word viral and what virality means when I'm looking at these historical papers. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm kind of borrowing this modern language as a way of making these older texts seem less strange. You know, I mean, part of it is about teaching what we're up to. Um, at the same time, I really, I've been having a lot of conversations lately. Uh, Karine Nahom is a scholar at, um, in Washington who wrote this book called Going Viral, and it's, it's really all about modern virality. She's a scholar of communications, and she defines virality more in terms of saturation of a network than in terms of raw numbers. Um, and so for her, like something could go viral within a particular community if enough members of that community shared it even if it doesn't have millions and millions of viewers, right? Um, that's been a really useful frame for me because like, I have a certain set of newspapers. And so I've been sort of thinking about it in terms of saturation of the newspaper network. So if something is reprinted, in, in my case, in at least like 30% of the newspapers because our data is so sparse, I, I talk about it as having gone viral. But I'm definitely, our version of virality in the 19th century is not the same uh, in terms of just, because we, we can't know how many people actually read it. We can know how many venues it was presented in, but it's impossible to know exactly how many people had eyes on it. Other questions? 
You mentioned that. Oh, is there a question? So you talked a lot about how um, when things are being spread that they get modified. Would you say that the newspaper's like ability to modify its inputs, like that's a, is that a crucial element, like the relationship between modifying something and then the ability to like get shared? Are, yeah. Are those two particularly like tied together? Would you say? Yeah. So, like all the things that are widely spread are also highly modified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely think. I mean, that's partly what I was trying to get at when I said there were things that were amenable to being recontextualized. Uh, I think that the kinds of texts that we're seeing that were most widely reprinted are those that are the most easy to put in a different context to excerpt. Like you'll often get a, a long text that then other newspapers don't print the whole thing. They print parts of it that sort of speak to their audiences, but not the parts that don't. Uh, and so I absolutely think that a text uh, flexibility in some ways is, is absolutely key to it spreading really widely. And what we don't see in the really viral stuff are, are texts that appeal to a really specific group or cause, right? They tend to be broader. So they're, uh, in the 19th century, the, the religious culture is very different than now. Like it's, it's much more broad. Something like 95% of Americans belong to a church <laughs> during the 19th century. But what you don't see are like Methodist texts <laughs> going viral. What you see are these like broad religious texts that you know wouldn't offend anyone. Because so they could be reprinted in a Baptist newspaper or a Methodist newspaper or even a Catholic newspaper. There were Americans were very nervous about the Catholics in the 19th century, but um, yeah. So that that kind of uh, flexibility is absolutely key to what goes viral. Yeah. You mentioned your students' reactions to you coming here today. And yeah. What do other academics or even the ones in your field, professors, think about Buzzfeed? What do English professors think about this? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We can edit this out. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I know it's hard to speak about English professors. Um, I think you'll find plenty of people in academia who's like, BuzzFeed is the death of journalism. Uh, or the, I don't know, they'll talk about our divided attention span in the digital age, et cetera. I mean, part of my interest is I, I, am, I am very interested in the really long history of um, writing technologies. Right? We tend to not sort of think of old technologies as technologies. We have this idea that like technology is this thing we invented five years ago. Um, but a book, I don't have, none of you have a book. Does anyone have a book? What's a book? <laughs> not a real one. A book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not a book. So like if you look at this, Books like th this is actually technically the technology here is the codex, right? Book is the thing that lives inside it, but the codex is pages bound between covers that you can flip through, right? This is a this is a communications technology, and we developed it over thousands of years. There are things like uh, we think of page numbers. Page numbers don't appear in the first books. It took hundreds of years for people to figure out if we put numbers on these pages then I could say, go to page 20, and you could flip right to page 20. That's called random access. The book enables random access. And it took thousands and thousands of years for us to kind of perfect the codex technology. And so this is my interest. Like I'm really interested in the ways that technology has shifted, and there are a lot of scholars who are. And so when I look at something like, I, I teach a class. It's actually the class that I, I couldn't make today because uh, I'm here, called mm -hmm. Technologies of Text. And we start with the invention of writing, and we end up with the internet. So it's a very long historical span. But another way that I sometimes frame that class is a history of people freaking out about technology. Right? So like uh, Plato, yeah, I'll give you a quick back. Plato publishes this uh, dialogue in which Socrates talks about how writing is a really dangerous technology because if we write things down, then our memories are going to suffer because we won't have to remember things anymore because they're on the page. <coughs> and if I if can just give you something uh, that, that I've written, then we won't have a conversation about it, and you could misinterpret my writing. And so he's talking about like, the dangers of writing in the same way that people talk about the dangers of the internet today. Like, we don't remember things anymore because we can look everything up in Google. Uh, so there's this long history of people sort of freaking out about what technology is doing to our brains. Certainly a lot of that in academia. <laughs> so there's a lot of people who are very worried about things like BuzzFeed and other internet technologies, how it's changing what we read, how we read. But there are a lot of other scholars really interested in the history of media and technology who I, I think would not. Cool. We like your opinion. What, <laughs> what other questions are there?
I was wondering just how much in each newspaper, like what percentage was original content and what percentage was yeah. That's a really good question because there are there are moments when I'm reading these newspapers where I wonder who actually sat down and wrote anything in the 19th century because really a lot of them, the bulk of the content is reprinted from other newspapers. Um, and in fact, um, there there's a scholar of the period who's argued that the newspapers couldn't have spread as rapidly as they did without that kind of aggregation because a lot of these newspapers in like a small town in Ohio. It was really one guy who did the whole thing. Like he, he edited it, he composed the page, he printed the, the newspapers themselves. And so there's this idea that with all these tiny, tiny little newspapers, they, would not, you, you, they couldn't have produced as many newspapers as they did if they all had to sit down and write every word. And so this kind of distributed, aggregated model allowed the system of newspapers to really dramatically expand in a way it couldn't have if they weren't all sharing with one another. Um, but a high percentage. I mean, when, when I look at them, it's, you know, 80, 90 percent of the newspapers printed from other newspapers. Um, I'm very curious what breaking news looked like in the 19th century. Have you come across any breaking news? So the, the headline for breaking news, at least in the later part of our study, we've only really uh, studied up to 1860 to this point. And in the next uh, phase of the project, we're going to be looking at all the way up to the turn of the century, up to mm -hmm. 1900. Um, really breaking news looked like news by telegraph, the big exclamation point. Because when, once the telegraph was introduced, this was really before like the wire services, like the AP. Like the AP is called a wire service because it was a group of people who exchanged stories by the wire, by the telegraph wire, right? That's why it's called the wire service. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, but this is before things like the AP, like organized these consortiums of newspapers. But still, when the, new, when the telegraph is introduced, it's this way to get instantaneous news. And this is also why a lot of newspapers, even some that continue today, are called the telegraph, right? They were trying to signal, like, we're cutting edge. We've got the breaking news. We're the telegraph, right? Um, and so that's a, a really common headline for breaking news is in by telegraph or news by telegraph. Um, beyond that, I mean, the news cycle is a little bit slower. And so there's not quite that same sense of urgency or instantaneousness in a lot of these papers that we would imagine. This was a great way to start our day and our weekend, although there's some work that still needs to be done. But Ryan, thank you so much for coming. We have a nice gift for you.